Hey, what's up everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome back to Monster Energy Supercross 2, the official video game where today we're going to be playing my custom replica of the 2019 Houston Supercross that uh, I've tried to make here in the game, did the best of my abilities with the track, uh, had to throw it in the gigantic stadium as uh, Houston uses this little like kind of back thing here where it like goes underneath the stadium kind of in this far corner that I'm going through right now. Um, so it made it a little tricky to fit it into one of the regular sized stadiums for uh, that the game gives us. So went with the bigger stadium, not a fan of doing that, but just kind of had to do it this week. And yeah, I think the rest of the track is pretty self-explanatory. But if you're new to these videos, maybe you've never seen them before on the channel, what I do every week is play the track that was just raced in real life and talk about all the funsies that went down uh, in Houston or any real life race for that matter. But we're talking about Houston today. Uh, Houston was a triple crown this weekend. So final round of the triple crown series. Those always seem to be uh, dramatic, whether or not you are for or against the triple crown. That is obviously your own opinion, of course. Um, I tend to like them. I don't think I would be for it if it went like to a full series thing uh, per se, but right now I feel like what they have with like kind of throwing them in as little wrenches in the in the championship series um, adds like a good level of drama to the series that you know kind of I felt needs it down the stretch particularly or at least needed it down the stretch in some of the past series that we've seen before. So like I said, it, you know, it's a it's a good little kind of groundbreaker uh, late in the championships especially but having three on a season to not you know I feel like just kind of break up the momentum you know we've had series that get really stale and boring towards the end with like the same guy or rider winning week after week and um, if you have a triple crown to throw in and kind of make it so that same rider or guy may not win out the rest of the series uh, I feel like that's a good way to kind of break up the flow as I said so whether you're for or against it, like I said, I think I'm, I'm down with what they got right now. I wouldn't necessarily say they need to change it, but I know that they've talked about going to at least more Triple Crowns before talking about bringing it to the full schedule. Uh, but yeah, Houston was a very interesting race. Uh, the Triple Crown made it, I think, obviously more dramatic than it would have been otherwise because... Well, I guess the first main was pretty good. <laughs> so let's talk about this first main event because it's probably the most eventful thing of the night in the 450 class. Um, rocks and hole shots. You have uh, Marv, Tomac, and Webb basically all going into this first corner side by side. Marv runs them all kind of wide. They go down this next section. Marvin's still on the inside. He messes up the whoop section because he said he was in second gear. Runs... Uh, Webb and Tomac again a little high in the corner um, Or actually I should say it was Webb who ended up down the right side of the track and ran Marv and Tomac a little high and then ensued about two laps of Very interesting teammate Punting games going on Marvin shoved it in on Webb one more time then Webb I guess must have just gotten tired of it and clobbered into Marv's swing arm, t you know, two or three times as he was trying to make a pass that ended up not working. And then they come up and over this over under bridge. Webb gets the power down, flies down the inside, jams on the brakes and just gently nudges Marvin off the track on that little, you know, backwards wall jump type thing. Um, and Marvin lost, I think three positions at the time. Um, and Webb continued on on his way as he was trying to, I guess they're behind Dino at this time too, but trying to run down Dean Wilson, um, hold off Eli Tomac and Cole Seely, and then Marvin started getting back into the, the fight a little bit. Now, why this is kind of odd, despite the fact that they're battling for a championship, obviously, is that they're teammates and they're training partners. They both train at Alden Baker's facility in Florida. They for lack of a better word or on agreeable terms at the moment they didn't used to like each other Webb and Marvin in the past but they're on different teams and now that they're on the same team they've kind of been told by uh by Alden by Roger DeCoster like hey you guys got to get along you're on the same team now essentially so Webb all year has said you know he went to Marv and Anderson and all these guys and apologized for his actions in the past they all you know accepted they moved on 
Well, come to find out this past week, Marvin actually, after the Seattle win slash not win, uh, went back to California and has been just kind of like training by himself in California with David Villeman and uh, Dylan Ferrandis, the other, you know, the Villeman's two riders, basically Marvin and, and Ferrandis. Um, and so Webb's kind of been somewhat on his own program. He's still out there with Wacko Zacco, uh, Osborne, but it, you know, crunch time in this championship, it's. I wouldn't say it's way out of the norm that these guys stop training with each other because we saw that with Anderson and Marv last year, but that last year was also because of some tension. Now, Webb went on to the DMXS radio show this past week and basically said he doesn't know why Marvin went to California. He just does what Alden tells him and that there's no tension between them at the moment. But, I mean, just a, from a you know casual observer of this race this weekend, I'd have to say there's some tension there. Um, yes, I think that there was a little bit of provocation there from the contact Marvin started and then Webb, you know, continued to push, push, and then got fed up with not being able to pass him and then shoved him. Um, but, you know, you don't see that type of riding really ever out of teammates, even if they're going for a championship. It just doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, I know Webb for sure got a tongue lashing from Roger and Alden and all the guys after that. And, um, you know, pushing Marvin on the tra off the track. I didn't really think it was all that bad of a move. Um, but it's interesting that he chose now to do it because there is a lot of racing left and a lot of opportunity for Marvin to, quote, give him one back, if you will, which I'm assuming will happen at this point. I mean, if they're not as friendly as, you know, has been said, and Marvin now knows that Webb's going to ride him that way, uh, I, I really feel like Marvin will at least take the uh, chance at some point, uh, whether to slice off Webb's front wheel in a corner or, you know, give him a similar shove on the entry of a corner or exit of a corner or something like that. Uh, Marvin's never been one to make the best looking takeout block passes. Um, obviously, we know that with Tomac, but he's done the same with Bogle and Weston Pike before where he was maybe a tad more aggressive than I think he had hoped. Uh, and so I'm curious to see how this plays out because if he runs it in on his teammate Webb and has a similar mentality to what he was trying to do before with Tomac and Weston and all those guys, I think Webb may end up on the ground and things will really start boiling over. Um, definitely something to pay attention to moving forward. But for the rest of the race, what I was kind of curious of was whether or not that was going to happen during that race because I'll tell you what, Webb is one guy that rides a lot better when he's got like a carrot kind of dangling in front of him, a la he's mad. And uh, he rode the best he rode all night long, in my opinion, when he was mad that Marvin was, you know, kind of in front of him and, and he couldn't find a way around him. And after that, I felt he was actually the third or fourth best rider riding wise the rest of the night. Uh, yes, he was able to win that second main event, but he also started well ahead of anybody that really could have challenged him. Marvin Tomac were about fifth and sixth. Roxon was down in the first corner, so he kind of had a bunch of guys that probably weren't going to do much to him behind him. And for a little bit, it seemed like Seeley was actually going to get him. So I didn't think Webb actually rode all that great in the second race. He just took you know advantage of a good start and an, an opportunity to get away early. Um, so... It's, it's weird how that dynamic worked out because it seemed like the second he pushed Marvin off the track, his brain kind of went back to, I, I guess, reality, if you will, and he no longer had this kind of speed that he was showing for those three or four laps where he was pushing Marvin around a little bit. Um, so what ends up happening basically is, you know, Webb goes 2-1-3, Marvin goes 5-3-1, and Webb wins the overall, wins the Triple Crown Championship, and... Uh, gains three more crucial points in the championship to now have a 17 point lead on Marvin. And the only reason I'm talking about just these two guys is because honestly, folks, this is it. It's going to be Marvin or Webb this year. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Eli Tomac fans. I, I feel for you at this point. Um, I've, I'm not like a gigantic Eli Tomac fan myself, and I really felt like he was going to win the championship this year, but I am out on Eli Tomac. I don't know what he's doing. I don't get it. I'm not sure what's working or not. Or you know, like the last main event, Tomac seemed to ride a little bit more like Eli Tomac, but he still got worked by Marvin, 
and this, this this type of stuff just has never happened in Tomac's career where like these guys that he's racing against are working him uh, yeah when he first came up he was playing second fiddle to Villapoto and Stewart sometimes and eventually Dungey when Dungey hit his stride but then once he got the ball rolling we haven't seen this kind of Tomac that is really just another guy since 2016 maybe maybe because he was pretty good in 2016 too he just never really got it completely done uh, and Roxon really hit his stride late in the year that year obviously um, but again so like I, I, a lot of what Tomac's problems are we keep bringing it up that it's down to you know his mentality isn't really there like he doesn't want it as bad as the rest um, and it seems massively exacerbated by the maneuver that happened in the final corner of the first main event where Marvin had got pushed off the, pe the track by Webb uh, charged forward, almost got to Wilson, crashed, went off the track and crashed, got up, and then completely recaught Tomac again, so basically catching him twice from pretty far behind, and was putting the pressure on him the last lap. Looks like uh, Tomac's gonna hold him off, goes through the final corner, and then Tomac slows down up the face of the triple uh, slash finish line jump. Marvin passes him on the top of the finish line jump, and I think just got a wheel on him as the transponder line crossed and Marvin was able to take the fifth place position away from Tomac and a lot of people are like, what the heck, why did he slow down? Why did he give it to Marvin? Is he just giving it to Marvin at this point? Um, the only plausible thing that I can think of, and I would assume that he would say the same thing, whether or not it's the truth, is he came into that final corner a little cautious, protecting his inside from Marvin, just in case Marvin sent it down to make a desperation pass in the final corner. And he, I, I kind of watched the replay a couple times, so I can't swear that this is the case, but I feel like he kind of missed his, his spot that he was going for in the corner, swung a little wider than he wanted to, and when it all kind of came unglued was when he turned up the face of the jump, he realized he wasn't going to have the speed to clear the triple. Now, what he should have been able to do still is clear the double, which means he would have had plenty of drive and speed to still cross the line ahead of Marvin, but because every other finish line jump on planet Earth except this one is a double uh, and not a triple, I think he thought for just like a split second, it's a double. I can't jump it. I have to roll it. I don't have the drive. So he checked up and that's how Marvin got him. That's the only thing I can think of is that like in his mind, he suddenly, you know, like realized, A, I don't have the speed to clear the jump and B, oh crap, it's a finish line. So I can't just like send it to the middle because there is no landing except there was, but by the time his head had processed all that, he was already slowing down to roll the whole thing and Marvin got him. That's the only thing I can think of. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. I, that's the only thing I can assume, as I said. Um, but regardless, you know, despite the last main event, him getting second, I just don't see it anymore. He has to win out and have a lot of things fall his way, a la some web DNF type things to really get this thing his way. I think he's 26 down now, so he's a full race distance down with four to go. I, I, it's over, in my opinion, it's over. Even if he really turns it on and gets a stride late in the season, at the very least, he's been behind Marvin speed-wise for the past four or five weeks. And that's just not going to get it done, in my opinion. So um, I'm out on I'm out on Tomac with Roxon uh, bruising his toe and falling well out of the championship hunt at this point. I really think it's down to Webb and Marv, and I whew, I have a tough time thinking either one of them is going to win this championship at this point with the way things have been going lately. Um, Webb obviously looks like he is in a prime position to do so, but making your teammate and you know your championship rival kind of an enemy of you with four rounds left in the series i felt was a little bit of a bad move uh emotions obviously got a little bit of the best of him and he said that in the post-race interview and said you know next time i gotta kind of control my emotions and not let things like that get at me as much um so yeah this is setting up a pretty interesting dynamic down the stretch where we see at least from what i can tell marvin is hitting his stride He's pretty clearly been the fastest rider the past four or five rounds, and it's turned into two wins, and 
I think he's working on uh, a five or six race podium streak right now. He's podiumed nine of the last 10 races and he just continues to, to do this. And I keep saying it because I just don't think he's out of the water yet. I feel one of these last four races, Cooper Webb is gonna have a bad race. Now, what is a bad race? I've said this before about Anderson last year. Turned out to be true at the end of the series, but it was a little too little too late by that point when Anderson had the um, uh, flat tire, or was it spoke damage maybe? I forget. Um, but he had to get a, a tire change at Salt Lake City, ended up finishing uh, 20th, I believe. Closed the championship down a little bit, but Marvin was pretty far out of it at that point and got it within striking distance, but needed something drastic at the finale to happen, and that didn't happen. Webb isn't really in that scenario. If Webb has any kind of mechanical, any kind of, uh, you know, bad-ish race outside of the top 10 level race, Marvin's there. Uh, yes, he's 17 points down, but he's pretty clearly, I think, gonna win at least a couple more of these races. And I'm not sold that Webb is gonna win the other two if Marvin wins two kind of thing. Like, I feel Roxon could get a win. I think Tomac may find a way to win, like, you know, East Rutherford or something along those lines. Um, so you have this interesting, I feel, dynamic still where it's not just mono -y mono it's Muskan versus Webb for the, you know, final four rounds, and Muskan has to win out and hope Webb gets at least one third. I don't think that that's the case. I think probably both of them still have a bad race in them, but I definitely feel so for Webb at some point. Maybe it's the mutter that everybody's expecting might happen in Denver or Nashville, or maybe it's just a weirdo mechanic like Anderson had. Uh, as I said, these streaks of just consistent good finishes out of uh, out of Webb is kind of unheard of. He's never really been a guy that's just consistently on the podium. Like, yeah, he wins a lot, but he would have the occasional bad race even when he's on a 250. And really nobody, none of these guys have ever been the type that's been kind of Ryan Dungey-ish or even old Chad Reed-ish where it's just like, I'm good. Like I can just finish second or third from here on out. I'm good. Like that's that's never been the case with any of them. So that's where I'm trying to, you know, draw on history of the past to kind of say like this is this is far from over and these are the reasons why. At least in in, in my opinion, obviously I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts as well, but man oh man, what an interesting interesting little shake up in the series now that we per perhaps a have a little bit of inter-team rivalry brewing between these two and they're going to downplay it of course they will but the second the helmets go on and they're on the racetrack and there's a championship potentially on the line for both of them i'd care to wager there's going to be some more contact and i think it may get worse before it gets better for both of them uh knowing their past and you know who webb is as a, as a rider and who marvin is as a rider and things like that so uh definitely going to be interesting to pay attention to and uh, looking forward to this next week at racing in the 450 class for sure. Uh, how about the 250 class though, just to touch on them real quick. Well, I really thought that this was Adam Cianciarulo's championship to lose and he's trying his damnedest to lose it. <laughs> he certainly isn't going down without a fight if you want to say that. Um, yeah, I mean like I really felt that with the way he'd been riding and you know, he was all over Dylan at Seattle that like Dude, San Cerullo, like, you just got to kind of put in some good rides, and you got this championship locked up. And then he goes and blows the start in the second main, crashes on this over-under jump, which is about the worst spot you can go down on the track because they never put a flagger on top of the over-under bridge. For what reason? I don't know why. I'm assuming safety concerns with him standing up there, but... Again, you, you need to have someone blocking the track from a blind jump and nobody was doing so, including the flagger that was in front of the jump. But having a, a flagger behind the jump just waving a yellow flag is a little ridiculous because they weren't doing anything. But I won't get into another flagger rant because I've had a thousand of those and you guys are probably over that. Uh, what was weird though is that we are seeing old Adam Cianciarulo rear his head again. The uh, I gotta freak out and get up and charge to the field and make a ton of mistakes and crash and do weirdo things. Now, the crash that I'm talking about on the over-under wasn't his fault. He was just a victim of circumstance. Cantrell battling with, uh, shoot, Moseman, maybe? Side by side over this tunnel jump. Cantrell drifted a little bit. Seems to put his hand out trying to get away from him. It was a very 
interesting maneuver by AC. Um, didn't work out though, and uh, got cross jumped and, and crashed. It's just a circumstantial thing. Sometimes those things go your way and sometimes they don't. That way, that time they didn't. But still, just to see, you know, seeing Cerullo have like a mini freak out and then in the last main event, again, another circumstantial problem gets a bad start and goes down in the whoops with, again, I think Moseman who crashed in the whoops and took Auberson with them and they're all stacked up and then seeing Cerullo has to charge forward, only able to salvage fifth place points on the night. Excuse me. And Ferrandis wins. The overall closes this thing down to five points for the championship. So destiny lies within Dylan Ferrandis' hands at this point. He has two wins in the last two races. If he can win two more races in the rest of the season, Dylan Ferrandis will win this championship. Uh, is that going to happen? I don't think so. But, hey, this has been opened up for a lot more discussion than what we saw prior to Seattle where... Ferrandez had zero wins and AC had a commanding points lead. Now Ferrandez has two wins and Cian Cerullo is only five points in front. This is not a write-off still. Like, this is not Cian Cerullo's championship anymore. This is Dylan Ferrandez has clawed his way back into this picture. Cian Cerullo has kind of done his part on throwing it away a little bit. And now we have some potential down-the-stretch drama with the West Series. So, uh, it's pretty cool that... Vegas, we're, we're probably going to see two championships decided in the 450 class and at least one of the 250 classes. This is, I think, uh, not how Cian Cerullo had envisioned it, but I'm pretty sure that's how it's going to play out at this point uh, with just the two rounds left to go. And Man, I'll tell you what, Dylan's looked pretty good these last couple rounds. Um, so long as he can stay healthy, and I think he can make this thing real interesting. So I'm... I'm chuffed, man. I can't wait to see these last four rounds of not only the, you know, 450 class and all the chaos that's going to ensue with that, but really this 250 class and what's going to happen now because I feel like this, for both series too, this kind of sets the tone for outdoors. We have a struggling Eli, a potentially injured Kenny, a, you know, bickering rivalry between Webb and Marvin, and I feel like it doesn't really give you a clear as day favorite for the outdoors uh, just yet. Um, you know, some people would probably still, I think, pick Tomac for the outdoors. I'm trying to think whether I would be on that bandwagon or not, but I'll have to think about it a little further after I uh, discuss with my own head whether or not Eli Tomac, who's won half of the last Supercross races, was able to win two outdoor titles, but only by about one race distance, and somehow he's going to carry this terrible momentum outdoors and do the same thing he has done the last two years? I don't know. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But even in the 250 class, yeah, maybe you have uh, Forkner as a favorite coming out of the East, but uh, don't ride out Ferrandis as an outdoor threat. Cian Cerullo probably wants to win a title before he moves up, and then you have you know Thomas Covington, Hunter Lawrence is coming back. There's a lot of drama to play in going to this outdoor season and we're only about a month and a half away from it now so it's uh it's gonna come up quick and with these championships coming down to the wire a lot of these guys may not have outdoor testing under their belt so again just a couple more talking points to talk about uh in regards to these potential championships being decided and how that affects uh the series that will follow right after that uh, again, I just can't wait for it all and uh, always love talking with all you guys about all the drama. I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to get this video out yesterday. Just been hellaciously busy, uh, but wanted to get it out today and hope you guys enjoyed it as always. But uh, try out this track for yourself. I don't think I mentioned the name of it, but it is SYS Space Houston Space 19 on the PC. That is your personal computer. And... Um, let me know what you think. Let me know your thoughts on what I had to say about this past weekend. And I'll see you guys in the comments section below. So thanks for watching again, and I'll see you guys later. So long for now.